Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can't hear you. All right. Well, this is the day the Lord had made, and I will. All right. We have good reason to rejoice because of the Lord Jesus as our Savior. Amen. So good to see you all here this morning. You know, I uh, want to thank you. For, first of all, we want to welcome you on behalf of One Voice and all the different churches that are represented. We want to thank you for taking time this morning to come and be a part of this service. First of all, we're fulfilling the Word of God. John 17 says, when we come together in unity, there's a promise that God gives us. His presence will be here to minister to our hearts. Amen? Amen. So, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. It's about honoring Jesus because of his grace and his mercy in our lives. How many know what the word honor means? In the Greek, it's very fitting. In the Greek, it means time. If you study it out, it means time. So this morning, you gave the Lord time by coming out of your comfort zone, com coming out of your busy schedules to give the Lord do what is his, which is honor your time. And after a while, everything we do, all of our time, whether we go to work, whether we're at home or at church, our time becomes honoring the Lord. Our whole life becomes honoring Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we want to thank you for uh, being a part this morning and honoring the Lord. And we're so grateful for this time together that the Lord has given us. Amen? You know, uh, would you please uh, all stand with me as we open in prayer and just commit this service into the Lord's hands? Hallelujah. 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 Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your mercy, grace, and peace multiplied in our lives. Thank you that you are a covenant-keeping God, a faithful God that loves each one of us so much, and you have good plans and purposes for each one. So I pray you continue to reveal yourself to our hearts, and Lord, lead and guide each one. So Lord, we just thank you that you gave a promise in your word. You said how good and pleasant it is when the brethren come together in unity, that when we can come together in one accord, in one place, to honor Jesus. It's not about the churches and names and positions. It's about King Jesus, that he deserves all the glory and the honor. So we bless your name and we thank you, Father. Now, Father, your word says that ask in the time of rain, and that you would send the rain. And Father, you know that our hearts are dry and parched. Our churches are dry and parched. Our city is dry and parched. That we need the rain of your spirit. We need an outpouring of your love and your power and your grace in an unprecedented way. And Father, we are grateful for the past blessings and how you've walked your church all these thousands of years. And now we've come to a culmination of this time. And you said, ask for that rain in the latter rain. So we ask for the rain of your spirit to be poured out on our city, poured out on our hearts, Pour it out on our homes and transform it and move in a sovereign way as you build your church and reach the harvest in this end time. So we ask for your anointing of your love to touch every heart, Lord, and move us into a compassion that we get out of our comfort zone and any laziness and to work when we have a chance, Lord, for this is a perilous day. But, Lord, it's time to arise and shine. So let your body arise and shine in this hour for your glory and honor. So we thank you. Lord we thank you we love you so much Lord Jesus we love you Lord and we're so grateful that we have this living hope in our hearts so now Lord we just commit our hearts we humble ourselves in your presence that your Holy Spirit have his way in everything be honored and glorified in Jesus name Amen. Amen. well good morning church you're already standing, so I'm not going to ask you to stand. <laughs> but I will ask you to sing and worship with and clap us. Clap your hands and dance. <laughs>
Because Christ is risen from the grave, that we are here today worshiping his name. And so uh, let's sing it out that our Redeemer lives.
It's a collection of evangelical churches across our city who love the Lord and want to lift high his name. And this is our theme from Romans chapter 15. It says this, starting in verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice, there it is, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of of God. This is why we're here today for the glory of God, and we're so grateful that you have come this morning. A couple of things to keep in mind. We do have bathrooms over here that are open. Please treat them with kindness and respect. The city has graciously extended uh, their season of bathrooms just for us. They unlocked it this morning, so yay! That's exciting. Uh, and again, if you don't have a song sheet or a communion cup, you need both, all right? We're going to be doing communion in a short little while. And over here by the barbecue, I think, are extras of both of those. And uh, if you don't have them, make your way over there. Grab one of those community cups and uh, uh, song sheets. Also, we do have a kids program. So right behind me over here in the playground, if you identify as a child, no, uh, if you're uh, grade five, uh, a grade five or so and under, you can head over there when the time is right. We'll dismiss you. Uh, our uh, First Baptist Church interns are running that program, and they're excited to have some great fun with you, and so we're thankful for that. Uh, and what else do I need to say? Anything else I need to say for announcements? Oh, yes, one more thing. We're going to be having a prayer time very shortly, uh, and what we're going to encourage you to do is in the area around you, just kind of gather with the people around you and pray together. Pray for our city. Pray for unity in our church and churches. Uh, and pray for the glory of God to... Uh, fall on us today and on our city that people would hear and know the good news of Jesus Christ. That's kind of what our, our prayer times will be focused on. And I know that might make some of you uncomfortable, and that's okay. We're all about stretching people, all right, in their faith. And uh, so it's a good thing. Um, there's no special prayer that you need uh, to pray to the Lord. He loves you if you're one of his children. Just call on his name, and he will love to hear from you. So, if you don't feel comfortable praying out loud, that's okay. Pass the baton to the next person. We're going to spend about five minutes doing that together uh, very shortly. And um, yes, barbecue. now, oh yeah, barbecue. <laughs> For, afterwards, don't run away. We have a bazillion hot dogs uh, that we want you to eat with us. And uh, th that is a great opportunity just to extend our fellowship time afterwards. So don't run away. Lunch is here. It's on the house. And uh, hang around for a little bit. I'm going to invite Jim Melnick to come to the front now. This is when you need your communion cup. So Jim is uh, from BFA, and he's going to be leading our communion time. So make sure you grab your cups now. Thanks, Kevin. As Kevin mentioned, uh, if you don't have one of the communion cups, and they look simply like this, Stick your hand up high, hold it up high, and uh, one of the ushers will uh, come around and make sure that you have them. Um, but for this morning, I'd like to read a text from 1 Corinthians. It's a text that's probably familiar for a lot of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is when Paul is addressing to the Corinthian church the etiquette of uh, communion. Starting at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we're doing here this morning. It's a remembrance service that we have when we practice communion. And I noticed not that long ago, actually, that the word communion has the word union in it. And that's we are what we are. We're unified with Christ when we take part in communion. We're not just remembering the sacrifice, but we're connected with him in that sacrifice that he did on our behalf. And because of that this morning, if you're here this morning and you haven't made that connection with Christ, if you haven't in faith and with a repentant heart come to Christ and asked him to be your Lord, your Savior, I ask that you simply refrain from taking part Nobody beside you is going to think the worse of you. In fact, they'll think the more of you for doing it. And continuing on. Continuing on, verse 27. So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So this is for all of us who have put our faith and trust in God. Paul was telling the Corinthians, we need to search our own hearts and to see if we are in a right place with God before we practice communion. So I ask you to do that this morning, just for a moment. Now that doesn't mean you're sin-free. None of us here are sin-free. If that was the case, None of us would have got a cup this morning. But I ask you to search your heart. Are you living in a rebellious state with God this morning? Are you living knowing that your lifestyle is not what God wants it to be, but you said, I don't care, I'm going to live it anyway. If that's the case, I ask you to refrain from taking part in communion. But instead, go to God in prayer. Go to Jesus Christ in prayer this morning and confess those sins and ask him to help you through it. Now, in just a few minutes, or a few seconds, I'm going to pray for the bread and for the, and for the, uh, the, uh, the juice. If you've never used one of these, they're quite simple. There's two lids to it. The first lid on top is very, very thin, and you have to look for it sometimes, but when you peel that back, you'll have access to the wafer inside. And then below that is a thicker pull tab, and that'll give you access to the juice. Now, if you are somebody who's perhaps has questions about communion, commitments to the Christ, commitments, should I take communion or not? I'd love to talk with you afterwards. I'll be over at the barbecue pit there helping Joe uh, toss the wieners around. And um, come and see me, or come and see Pastor Ernie or Pastor Kevin or any of the other pastors that are here. I'd love to hear your story or talk with you about your journey. And I'm sure Kevin will have more to speak about that later on in the service. So now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning. We remember, we remember that sacrifice Jesus Christ, your son, made for us on that cross. I know that it cost him a lot, not just in physical pain, but he was separated from you upon that cross. And he cried out to you, why have you forsaken me? He did that for us. He gained nothing from it. Lord, you gained nothing from what you did, but you gave us everything in doing so. And we thank you this morning. And as we open up these cups and as we partake of the wafer inside, we remember your body that was smashed and bruised and broken for us. And we do so in great love for you. And I pray for these things in your name. Amen. give you a few seconds if you haven't opened them up yet. Sometimes you have to look for those little lids. Now I'll give thanks for the cup. Lord, we continue with our prayers before you this morning. And I pray that I, our service here this morning, all of these different churches that have gathered together to worship you in unison, 
that this will be a sweet fragrance to your nostrils this morning. That you will look down and smile upon us knowing that we are not perfect. We're still sinful in our nature, but we can glorify to you as our children, knowing that we have been forgiven of those sins, that we've come before you with hearts that are repentant, with souls that are joyful, and with a longing to see this world someday taking part in communion as well. What an incredible experience that would be. So Lord, we pray in thanksgiving not with joy that Jesus had to go to the cross and shed his blood, but with thanksgiving that he did it in obedience to you. And I pray that our obedience to you would be even just a fraction of that shown to us by you, Jesus. And I pray for these things in your name. Thanks, everybody, and we'll hand it back to the band. Let's just stand as we continue to worship this morning.
Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you are my King. Well, this next song might be new to some of you. It's called uh, Holy Forever. And before we get to that, though, the children. If you are a child in age five to a uh, grade five, you can make your way behind this lovely band shell and uh, join our kids program back there. So uh, we bless you as you go. Have a great time, kiddos. And this song is called Holy Forever. And again, if you don't know it, uh, we're going to pray first. Thank you. I got the order all mixed up. So we're going to pray first before we sing that song. So. Uh, if you would gather in groups of maybe six to eight in a little circle in the area around you and pray for those things that we talked about earlier, pray for something that might come up in your group. This is not a time to catch up, right? This is a time to pray. We're going to catch up when the hot dogs are, uh, pun intended, okay? And uh, so uh, please just spend time, focus on prayer. We'll be about five or seven minutes or so and go pray.
Listen to the words of Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints with the breadth and love and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all his generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. It was beautiful to see you guys holding hands as you prayed. Let's just stand again as we continue to worship. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the man. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the man. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name
Praise the Lord. Amen. Guys, get receipts. If you have a Bible, paper, or non-paper version. <laughs> Went away. Open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and Lou's going to do our Bible reading for this morning. All right, so 2 Corinthians 13, we're going to start at verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this is about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. But we pray to God that, we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you, have may, or that you may do what is right though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak, and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. For this season I write these things while I'm away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me, for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss or a hug. All the saints greet you. The, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Well, it's good to be with you, church, this morning. My name is Kevin, and in case you don't know who's out on the stage here, that's uh, Louie. Uh, this is Hannah on the piano. This is Selena. That's Peter. That's Jay and Jace. Uh, we make up your worship team this morning. What a uh, pleasure it is and a joy to be able to lead you in worship this morning. I want to invite you to pray. We're going to spend a few moments in the Word of God this morning. Hopefully, it's encouraging to your heart. Hopefully, it's challenging as well. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, we thank you for this awesome opportunity to crack open your word again. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would speak to our hearts today. Lord, that we be challenged by your word. Lord, your word is truth. Sanctify us by your truth. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be sensitive to your leading. Uh, Lord, speak through me. I pray that the words I speak would not come from me, but would come from you. Lord, that we would go from this place encouraged, uplifted, rebuked if necessary, exhorted if necessary. We thank you that your word corrects and does all those things as well, rebukes and exhorts. So Lord, may it do its work in our heart today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but conflict is an inevitable part of life. Wherever you go, conflict exists. Now, just to get a little audience participation and to help prove my point, I need your help this morning. So, Leaf fans, I want to hear a big Leaf Cry on the count of three. Are you ready? One, two, three. How bad? Now, on the other side, the conflict part is the Habs fans, right? So Habs fans, let's hear from you guys this morning. Excellent. And so we share a little bit of conflict there on the ice as we cheer for our different teams. Now, of course, if you're married, you know conflict exists, don't you? No marriage is conflict-free. And uh, if you're a parent, you know conflict exists, especially if you have a two-year-old or a teenager. Teens, you know this exists too, right? You might have some conflict with your parents. Now, I'm sure your workplace environment is conflict-free. Uh, mine is most of the time. I work at a church. It should be. All right, anyways. And, uh, of course, church. In the church, there's conflict. So now you're like, what? How dare that happen? How there be? How is there conflict within the church. And this morning, the text that we uh, had read just a few moments ago, I want to be parking on this morning, is talking about conflict. Paul is writing to a church in conflict. First Corinthians was a, a messed up church, and Paul needed to write a bunch of things to them. But if you take a look at the very beginning of First Corinthians, where at the, right at the very beginning, he says these words. He says in First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, 
by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no division among you, but that you may be united in the same mind and the same judgment. He finishes 2 Corinthians with the same appeal, an appeal to unity, a call to togetherness. And here we are together with one voice, and the appeal is the same. If you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, if you have believed in his death on your behalf, if you've trusted in the fact that he has risen from the grave, then you are saved, adopted into this family of God. And we are family. And we are united together by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, yeah, you may come from different denominations and you might think of different things on a few different topics, and that's okay. But this is what unites us and this is what causes to, us to be family in Jesus Christ. And so, this is what we want to focus on today about what does it mean to be united? What are the things that we can do to make sure that we take seriously the unity that we have in Jesus Christ? And so this morning, I want to focus on, on a couple of things. I want to focus on this aspect, the question that we should all be asking ourselves. And this is not a one-time question. It's a question that we should ask ourselves regularly. We focused on it in communion and just a beautifully fit together passes there. Examine yourselves, test yourselves. Am I on the team? That's where we're going to start with. Am I on the team? Secondly, what unites us together, being on the team, is the truth. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And making sure that we're focused on the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, third thing, we're going to end off with this. We're going to make sure that not only do we test ourselves, not only are we on the same team, but that we're together in unity. So that's where we're going this morning. And so bear with me for a few moments as we unpack this text and and hopefully it teaches us, it speaks to our hearts today, and causes us to be united together in Jesus Christ. So let's take a look uh, at the text here for a few moments. Just verse uh, 5 and 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. It says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or don't you realize about this, about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. There's a lot of testing going on there, isn't there? I'm not sure about you, but when I grew up, I did not enjoy tests. Those things, pop quizzes, they still exist today? I have no idea. I hated those things. I remember my grade 13 math class. This is, I'm not joking with you. This is not just a sermon illustration. My grade 13 math teacher, his name, Mr. Slaughter. I'm not joking. That was his name. And he, in fact, slaughtered me in that class. I survived barely with a 55 in that test, or in that, in, that, in, that, in that class. But, you know, it's interesting. That word examine and slaughter have a similar connection to them. This is not just an examine, like, check the boxes thing. This is an in-depth test that you're supposed to do. It's not just an open book test. This is make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure. Test yourselves. Examine yourselves. Make sure that you are in the faith. And so the question that we need to be asking ourselves when it comes to am I in the faith is, do I believe the right things? Am I believing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Am I believing in his vicarious death for me, his substitutionary death for me? Do I believe that? And not just, yeah, I believe it, but yeah, I believe it, and on this foundation I stand. Do I believe that Christ died for me? Do I believe in his resurrection? Not just, oh yeah, the Bible says it, maybe it's true. No, this is true, and I'm banking my eternity on it. This is what we're talking about when it comes to examining ourselves to make sure that we're in the faith. So my question to you, church, this morning is this. Are you in the faith? Not just do you come to church. Not just do you pray occasionally. Not do you just open the Bible every now and again. Are you in the faith? Have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone for your salvation? That's it. That's all. And on Him, our foundation rests secure. But there's a second part to this equation, this test, if you will. Not just do we examine ourselves, but it also says to test ourselves to realize that Jesus Christ is in you. So is Christ in you? And this is that the difference is this, is that, yeah, we can sometimes mentally ascend to the things of the faith, but is Christ actually dwelling in us? Has the Holy Spirit taken residence in your heart this morning? Does he rule and reign 
in you? Is Christ in you? That's what this is talking about. And so when Christ is in us, this is talking about this reality. Does your lifestyle back up what you say you believe? The Bible is very clear about that. Yes, our faith is confessional, and, and it is on our faith that our, our, on our, our confession of faith in Christ that our faith rests and stands. However, if we're not backing that up with a lifestyle, what we say means nothing. Is Christ in us? Are we living a lifestyle that shows that to be true? And nobody can answer that question about you and God and maybe the people around you that know you intimately. But this is the idea of, hey, do I just put a mask on when I come to church? Do I make myself look good when the Christians are around me? What about the, the times when you're all by yourself and nobody's watching but you and God? Can you say that Christ is in you then? What about the time at work when you hit your thumb with a hammer? Is Christ in you then? You know, you know, Jesus has this saying. He says, we will be known by our fruits. What are our fruits? Our, our fruits are the fruit of repentance. Matthew talks about that in Matthew 3, verse 8. Are we regularly confessing our sins, keeping with God? That's what the fruit of repentance is all about. Do we have the fruit of the Spirit in us and growing in us? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Not perfectly, but are we growing in those things? Can we say, this year I'm more loving than last? This year I've got more self-control than last? Are we growing in these things? And really the test is this, is, is your fruit showing? Is your fruit showing? I remember back in the day, uh, we used to play a little trick on people who didn't know the English language very well. We would say, ha ha, your epidermis is showing tea. All right? That just means your skin's showing. Right? In the same way, is your fruit showing? Can people around you point and say, yeah, that, there's something unique about that guy or that lady. That their fruit is actually showing. That they can tell by their lifestyle, what they say, and how they interact with people that, yeah, Christ is in them. So this is the test. Are we examining ourselves to see that we're on team Jesus? So that's the first thing I want to encourage us with, to make sure, right? Test yourselves. Bring out Mr. Slaughter, if you will, and examine yourselves hard. Take care. And our teamness, if you will, is unite on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Which brings us to the second thing. It's the truth that binds us together. Verse 8 says this, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. It's the truth that binds us together. Now, when it comes to our theological differences, we might have some Calvinists here. We might have some Arminians here. When it comes to our giftings and our spiritual giftings, we might have some cessationists here. We might have some continuationists here. When it comes to different things of our faith, we might disagree on some of the minor things. And guess what? That's okay. We can learn to agree to disagree on those minor things. But on the major things, are we majoring on the major things? This is the truth that is being spoken about here. The truth that binds us together. The truth that is located in a person. Jesus Christ. The person who has defined truth, he's made truth, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. Are we focused on him and him alone? See, it's the truth that binds us together. As Christians, we cannot be bound together to Muslims. Why? Because for them, Jesus Christ is not God. For them, he's simply a prophet. So we can't have that unitedness or togetherness with them. We can't have a uh, binding together with a Jehovah's Witness. Why? Because they believe that Jesus is simply a created being. He's Michael the Archangel, not God. We can't have that togetherness. Same thing with a Mormon. We can't have that togetherness because why? Their Jesus Christ is a different Jesus than ours. They believe that he worked his way up to Godhead, and so can you and I. We can't be bound together with them, but we can be bound together as Baptists with Pentecostals, as Bible Chapel people with Charismatics. 
We can be bound together. Why? Because it's the truth of Jesus Christ that binds us together. We believe the truth. And it's on that foundation that we have the truth. And so let's make sure that when we gather together, we're focused on the main things. Make the main thing the main thing, and the main thing is Jesus. So, yes, you might disagree with your brother and sister in Christ on some things. That happens. And, and, and yes, maybe some trust is broken along the lines. And yes, you might have to switch churches occasionally because of those things. But make sure you're switching and changing for the right reasons. Amen. Amen. The truth binds us together. And I love how Paul ends this, verse 14. He says, this is what matters, right? Notice what he says. It's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he, how he, what he says about Jesus there. A couple things. It's grace. The free gifts of Christ on the cross that binds us together. The grace of the Lord Jesus. It's his lordship that binds us together. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That binds us together. And so we have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also have the love of God that binds us together. It's the love of God. God loved us when? First, before we were sinners. And that's what binds us together. It's the love of God that we then not only love him, but we love one another. And then it is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The reason why we can do stuff like one voice is because we all, those who call on the name of the Lord, have the spirit of Christ living and dwelling in us. And so we're able to say we are one family. So not only should we be taking a look, making sure that we're on the right team, not only should we be doing the testing and make sure the truth is what binds us together, but I want to make sure that we are targeting unity, that we are a team together. So the last little bit of, of these verses kind of do a rapid fire of commands at us. And these commands are not, again, the Bible doesn't give you suggestions when it's in command form. It's not saying, well, do it if you think it's the right thing for you, right? Do it if you like it, right? No, that's not what it's talking about. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And if we do these things that Paul ends off with rapid fire succession, this is how we target community. This is how we make sure that we're a team united in Jesus Christ. If we do these things. You know, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but one of the main things Satan targets within the church is unity. And so if we guard that, if we make sure that we're focused on guarding that, then Satan's not going to have a foothold within our churches. He's not going to be able to break us apart because that's what he wants. He wants us fighting amongst ourselves over things that don't really matter in the long run. Make sure we don't, we're not doing that. Here's what he says. Before we get there, though, I want to give you a little bit of illustration. I played some pretty high-end baseball back in the day. Uh, this is what this is, in case you're wondering. It's a baseball injury. I still think I can play. Anyway. So back in the day, um, we would go regularly on tournaments. And so our number one starter was not me. Our number one starter was a guy who got drafted. He went to Texas University. He threw 90 miles an hour as a 16-year-old. And so he, he, he was a good ball player. And so our team was all excited about Friday, Friday night. And we'd be together, we united, we'd play really good baseball, and we would always win the first game. But then Saturday morning would roll around. If you know anything about teenage boys when they're away from their parents, stupid happens. And stupid would always happen on Friday night. The guys would get out the beer and they would drink, and they would be hung over the next morning. And guess who was the starting pitcher for Saturday morning? Always me. And so... The guys would not be able to hit a ball because they couldn't see it. There would be error after error. We would not be united together as a team. And eventually we would lose the tournament because we were not united together as a team. And that is a, a good illustration of, of how we can fail as a church. When we're not united as a team, we can again lose focus. And we can fail the task at hand. Let's make sure we're not doing that. So verse 11, let's pick it up there. It says, finally, brothers... That's family talk, isn't it? Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are a family. We're together. And if you know anything about families, and probably you have this saying in your family, see if you can finish this saying, family stick. They all oh, good for you guys, right on. Family stick together through thick and thin. Why? 
Because we're family. This is what we do. And as the family of God, this is what we do. We stick together. And so let's make sure that we're recognizing this fact, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, this is not something that we need to get upset about, all right? But this is the reality. You, we, are going to be together forever. That's exciting, all right? That's not, oh, that's not one of those things. This is an exciting thing. Be together forever. And so Paul says, because of that fact, what should we do? Rejoice. This is in command form. Because of what Christ has done for us, because we are together in the body of Christ, we rejoice. You know what a synonym of rejoice is? Enjoy. Are you enjoying the fellowship that you have with brothers and sisters in Christ? That is not a suggestion, it's a command. So often we come to church and we show up late and we sit at the back and our arms are crossed and we got a grumpy look on like this is the last place we ever want to be and then we leave early so nobody can talk to us and we kind of have our hats pulled over our heads so nobody can see us going in or out. That's not enjoying anything. Are you rejoicing when you have that type of attitude? Absolutely not. And so, so we should be rejoicing when we see each other in the Walmart, it's not like, I hope he doesn't see me. Quick, run away. I don't want to talk to that guy. When we see each other at church, it should be an embrace. Rejoicing. Hey, we are on the same team together. We're going to spend eternity together. We love Jesus together. Are we rejoicing together? Second thing, this command next is to aim for restoration, is what the ESV says. But the other, another way to say it is to restore or mend. Think about a, a broken net. And when the net is broken, when you're fishing, right? What happens when the net's broken? It doesn't work right, does it? And we need to work at mending that. And within the family of God, guess what? There's some mending that needs to go on occasionally, isn't there? Because we say we do stupid things. One of the things I say at our church all the time is when you gather 200 sinners together, something stupid is going to happen sometimes. It just is. And so instead of taking our ball and going home and running away, which unfortunately many people do, and hurt happens, I get that. I'm not trying to minimize hurt in any way, shape, or form. But are we willing to mend what is broken? Relationships that are broken. When people say and do things that hurt. This is a command. Again, not a suggestion. Are we mending the nets that are broken? Third thing, we should comfort or encourage one another. The same word is used of the Holy Spirit, the comforter. He is the comforter, but he's the comforter through whom? You and I. We are called to comfort and encourage one another. And, and that's so hard to do, right? When was the last time you wrote a text to somebody? You just text them and say, hey, thanks for filling the blank. I'm praying for you. When was the last time you emailed somebody? When was the last time you came to somebody at church and just prayed with them? This is what it means to encourage or comfort one another and also just be there with somebody. When they're going through a tough time, wrap your arm around them. I'm here for you. You don't even have to say anything. Just be there. This is comforting one another. Not only should we comfort one another, we should agree with one another. Again, this is not an agreement. You must agree on every single thing. No, this is, do we agree on the main thing? Keeping the main thing, the main thing. Again, a command. Agree with one another about Christ. Agree with one another about his resurrection. Agree with one another about his substitutionary death. Agree with one another. We have the Holy Spirit and Christ in you. These are the main things. Yes, there's a few more, but these are the main things. Are we agreeing on the main things? Again, a command. And then we're called to live in peace. This is the idea of shalom. Right? Of just recognizing that the God of peace is living in us and he's called us to peace. We are bound together through the Holy Spirit who brings us peace with God and peace with each other. Are we at peace with one another? Are we living in peace with one another? And then verse 12, Louis mentioned this a little bit earlier. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And we're like, really? The Bible says greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, let's understand something. Sometimes the Bible is 
rooted in culture. And if you know anything about the culture at the time, that's what they would do, right? They would do, and some cultures still do that today, right? Uh, the Italian culture, I think, still does this, right? That, right, on the cheek. That's just, that's what that's talking about. Now, in our culture, we don't do that. And everybody said, amen, amen. all right? We, we fist pump, right? We, we, we high five, we handshake, and we hug. And so this is the idea of greeting one another affectionately. Like we're family. That's what it's talking about. So are we greeting one another like we are family? It is a command. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. Is conflict inevitable? Yes, it is. But can we still examine ourselves, test ourselves to make sure we're in their faith, make sure that we're on the same team. Yes, we should. Can we still focus and make truth, the truth of the gospel, what binds us together? Yes, we can. And can we focus on team unity? Yes, we can. And yes, we should. And as we do that, we're going to honor the Lord because we are brothers and sisters in Christ who love the Lord Jesus and are going to spend eternity together with him. I want to close just with this verse 14, which just so beautifully wraps up what Paul is trying to get into our heads today. It says this again. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. All those people said? Amen. And worship team, come on back up. We're going to sing with uh, our closing song, which is kind of an anthem for one voice. It's called Build Your Kingdom Here. And I want to see some dancing and foot stomping and foot clapping. Foot clapping? What's that? Hand clapping. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray.
Show your love.